want to welcome everybody to MS Conversations Now. This is a running program by MS Views and News. We have been doing this program. Well, we started off the year. We were going to be doing all of these in person in various portions of the country. And then we had to do some that were virtual. And now we're trying one that we have a small audience here today. And uh, we're in like 2,000 square feet of space here. Everybody is very socially distanced. And as you can see behind me, our two guests, they're probably about 10 feet apart. So uh, they're able to be without masks right now as well. All right, so for those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman, and I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. And that's a long story. I'm not getting into all that. We're just going to start moving things along here. Firstly, I want to thank you all again for being here today. I want to thank our audience, and I want to thank our virtual audience, because without you, we couldn't do these types of programs. All right, next, I want to thank our supporters of this program series. As you can see on the board behind me, I don't know if you could see the whole thing, but Novartis and Bristol Myers Squibs are the supporters of this program series. So we want to give them a round of applause. Yay, thank you, everybody, thank you. That's awesome, thank you. All right, also, um, we have a different program layout here. I'm going to take this off for a moment, okay? We have a different program layout here. So we have our guest, Connie Easterling, who's a nurse practitioner, and we have our MS patient champion, Jill, who will be having a conversation about nine different topics that we've given them to speak about. During this program, we're going to ask that they intermittently reach out reach over to our audience and ask them how they would, you know, if they have any questions, okay? And we'll do that every now and then throughout the program. Okay, great. All right, next, we have at the end of the program, okay, after we go through nine different topics, we're going to ask and we're going to read the questions that you guys are putting in online, all right? So on your screen, there's a place for you to type in your questions, all right? And then I will be behind the cameras and I am going to read off those questions and we'll let our speakers answer your questions. Please, if you want specifically for only one person to, to answer the question, please just put in your notes who the question is for. Otherwise, I'll probably just be able to figure it out. All right. So next, we have, um, I want to just read to you a little bit about Connie Easterling, our nurse practitioner, who has worked in multiple sclerosis exclusively for 22 years. She's past president of the International Organization of MS Nurses, that's MSRNs as it's known, and she's currently working with, uh, she currently works at the MS Care Center of Neurological Services of Orlando. And so, again, we're going to let we're going to let Jill steer the way. Connie's going to speak. They're going to speak with each other. They're going to talk to the audience. They're going to speak with all of you. We're going to ask questions. And let's get this show started, OK? Thank you very much. Hi, Connie. Hi, Jill. We're going to start with a discussion about MS progression. Okay. Can you talk to us about that a I little sure bit? I can. MS progression occurs in any type of multiple sclerosis, whether you have a progressive form or a relapsing form of MS. And there's a number of ways that we can, excuse me, we can identify uh, MS progression. One is you may be a patient that has no signs or symptoms of uh, d disease progression, but on a routine MRI, we may see new lesions, we may see enhancing lesions, we may see atrophy or hypointense lesions. That's a sign of progression of your disease. Another way that we see progression is in a patient who comes in and they have relapses. They have symptoms of relapse and they may uh, have some level of disability and after three to four months they come back and that those symptoms don't go away and that is considered to be uh, disease progression. Uh, Connie, another, excuse me, can yes. you tell us what progression is exactly? Oh, I'm sorry. Progression is a, an increase in your ability to function. It can affect your cognition, it can affect you physically, your vision, your ability to walk, anything that uh, makes your life worse, makes it different, and it, it, it's moving you towards a level of disability. Okay, so one of the things that I've noted over the years is patients increase in medication use. So if this year 
Uh, one of my patients is using six or seven symptom management tr medications, but last year they were using two. That indicates to me that that patient has had some disease progression, and we have to evaluate that further. So. Okay, that's interesting. Um, is there anything a patient can do to slow the progression? Absolutely. Um, now we have treatments for relapsing and progressive forms of MS. I think the number one uh, thing that patients need to consider and to do per their, uh, the advice of their neurologist is to be on a treatment for multiple sclerosis. Um, that will slow down the progression of the disease. And then there are some lifestyle um, changes that they can make that will that will prevent disease progression. The first one that comes to mind is smoking. Smoking is the number one thing that people do, some people do, uh, that can lead to MS disease progression, increased disability over time. Can progression be reversed? Progression can be reversed. Like if, you're, if you have a relapsing form of MS and you have a relapse and you have increased symptoms during that relapse, um, over time, those areas of demyelination or inflammation in the central nervous system um, may recover. There may be remyelination. Uh, some of the healthy brain may reroot itself, and so some of the symptoms of relapse will go away, and they may recover. In progressive forms of MS, it's um, uh, they may uh, not have progression for a period of time, but generally any progression that they have in their disease is there to stay. So, okay. Is age a factor at all? Of age is, yes, age is a factor. Um, it's interesting that the older you're diagnosed with MS, the more, the faster you're going to move to disability. Um, let's say a young child at 10 years old is diagnosed with MS, they're likely not to reach uh, disability progression for 20 or 30 years. But a person who uh, gets diagnosed at 40 or 50, they may reach progress in, or have progression in 15 or 20 years. So age is a factor. Age is a factor in just about everything, but um, the, the more diagnoses you carry, for instance, diabetes, cholesterol, multiple sclerosis, hypertension, the more stress that's placed on the immune system, and that's called immunosenescence. And it means that the immune system doesn't work as efficiently, as efficiently now as it once did. And so um, you may, your, your brain and your spinal cord may not recover as, as well as it did when you were early in the stages of multiple sclerosis. Do you think that age, I'm um, sorry, do you think that exercise and or diet can influence progression? I, I do. Um, exercise does so much. I've done a lot of reading on exercise recently, and they've learned through studies that exercise increases the development of new brain cells. Um, exercise also um, increases a brain volume, and it increases gray matter volume in the brain. It prevents atrophy, and it, of course, in, in other ways, it helps depression. It helps resolve a lot of the MS symptoms you may have, such as walking and gait and movement. So exercise, even if you just walk for one hour twice a week, that can improve your symptoms rem remarkably. Interesting. Can you talk to us about um, understanding the symptoms of MS, whether they're physical and or cognitive? Sure, so the symptoms of MS uh, are, as Jill said, cognitive or they are physical. Physical symptoms are those that many times we can see, uh, abnormal gait, spasticity in the legs, weakness in the legs, can be a weakness or um, tremors in the upper extremities. Those are visible symptoms. Um, Poor vision from MS can be a physical sign. But cognitive um, deficits or symptoms in MS are sometimes more difficult uh, to deal with. If, if, years ago, I used to say, if you ask a patient, would you rather be in a wheelchair or lose your cognitive function, most patients would say they'd rather be in a wheelchair. But cognitive dysfunction can occur early in the disease process. Um, it can be anything from short-term memory 
to delay in processing information. So if I go out to the waiting room and I call a patient's name and there's no response, and I may have to call it a next time. And the next time, while that patient is trying to process what I say, they may have word finding difficulties. Um, they may have um, difficulty with attention, organization, and so forth. And many times, those types of symptoms keep patients from going out into society because they feel embarrassed about that. So those are just some of the signs of cognitive dysfunction. Anybody have any questions here? So for people with multiple sclerosis, is there any difference between infusion therapy or oral therapy? Yeah, is there one better than, is there one better than another? So um, every person with MS doesn't respond to every treatment. So you may respond to an oral treatment, whereas another patient may not respond to an oral treatment, but they respond to an infusion. So the treatment that's best for you is the one that you will respond to, the one that can delay progression to disability, the one that can delay relapses and prevent atrophy in the brain and, and new lesions in the brain. So it depends, and sometimes we go through two or three treatments before we find the treatment that really works well for the individual okay you, <laughs> you were talking about exercising and you talk about an hour walking but as many of us with MS you know walking is a, a challenge to put it that way and what is the other choices or any other ways that we can improve or do other kind of exercises to help us you know move our body Okay, so there are um, exercises or type of exercises that you can do even if you are in a wheelchair or you have difficulty walking distance. There's Tai Chi, there's yoga, you can do that from a sitting position. Exercise means movement. So if you can't use your legs, you can exercise your upper body. And uh, the best way to do that, and it's really difficult for patients with MS to do weight and many patients do weightlifting or weight use uh, weights because they feel kind of heavy. But using bands, you know, the bands you can get, you may need to be taught how to do that by a physical therapist. But the bands, they have different um, t intensity of bands. And starting with a band, just that stretch the arm, can go out this way. You can either put a band around your, your foot and raise the foot, pull the foot up and back. So there's a lot of ways. And we have a great speaker um, that speaks for News and Views a lot, and she's a physical therapist. And she is, she really, you should look at some of her programs that we've done in the past. Can I just add to that? There are a lot of exercises that you can do even when you're sitting. You can be marching in place, moving your legs up and down. You can be doing um, uh, calf lifts while you're sitting, or you can stand at the kitchen counter and hold on and do calf lifts, or even do marching while you're standing. You can, um, you can do push-ups against the counter. And there's lots of things that you can be doing on your feet to get your base of support down to the ground. So just being physically disabled and, and scooter bound or wheelchair bound doesn't mean you can't exercise those parts of your body. Say that again, please. The name of the guy that you, they always have the, the videos that he has MS and he's a trainer. Jeffrey Siegel. Jeffrey Siegel, she's asking about. And what, who Connie was uh, mentioning earlier is Gretchen Hawley, who's, who's a uh, physical therapist. And you have a question. So concerning exercise, she wants to know how long she would have to do exercise for. Well, you could do it in short spurts. Um, you could do it um, three or four times a day, for, do it 10 minutes, do it 10 minutes at lunchtime, 10 minutes in the afternoon. Short spurts are great. And um, they work just as well as people that go to the gym and the exercise for two hours. So it's the, the important thing is to move because movement is important and it's uh, building some type of muscle, decreasing the amount of fat in your body so that your BMI is within a normal level. That's very important because obesity is very inflammatory and it's devastating to multiple sclerosis. 
She has a recumbent bike at home that she does three times a week. Good for you. That's great. I forgot bicycle riding. Bicycle riding is is easier for some people than walking. And a recumbent is great because that air that comes from the wheel can blow back on you so you don't get so uh, overheated. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Recumbent, right? She's talking about the one that she sits in her. Moves her legs and her arms. And everybody, the reason why we're not letting people just talk into the microphone is because, you know, it's, we don't want the germs on the microphone, okay? So we're trying to just keep this limited. All right, so what about walking in the water? That's right. Very good. Very good suggestion. So uh, aerobic exercises are very good because there's no resistance. So you get in the pool and you start moving. And uh, since we live in Florida, uh, right now the water is very hot. But so it may be difficult for you to um, to get in the pool and exercise. But if you're not heat sensitive, you could get in the pool and move. And if you do it, get in the pool in the early morning when the water is not so hot. Because as the day goes on, I think today my pool was like 98 degrees. So. I yeah. thought mine was bad at 92, so. Yeah, right. So most, uh, many of you remember Patty Bulbrick. She's moved to Colorado, but she, I um, worked with her for almost 10 years in MS, and she always used to say, water no, no hotter than 84 degrees for the MS patient, so. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, understanding brain health and MS relapse. Okay. Um, let's start with talking about MS, MRIs in relation to progression. Okay, so I think I mentioned a little bit about the MRIs. So MRIs um, are improving all the time. And now we have very, we generally, we've always done the MRI looking for the, the T1 uh, hypo-intense lesions. Then we do the T2 looking for the whole burden of disease. And, um, but now we can do much more fancy, fancy MRIs that tell us um, progression of the disease earlier. That's when, so, and shows us damage, like detrusor, detrusor weighted images and so forth. So um, your question was with regard to progression? So when we're looking at the MRIs, we always, first of all, I look for hypointense lesions and I look for new bright lesions on T1. That's after the gadolinium is given. So if I see new enhancing lesions, that is progression whether you have symptoms or not. If I see hypointense lesions, we call them are black holes, which I hate that term, but if we see black holes that you didn't have before, uh, then that is considered progression. It means that your treatment is not working. And so then we have to look for switching you to another treatment and, and uh, finding a drug that works better for you. Also, um, MRIs can show, um, sometimes you can see on certain types of films, you can actually see the gray matter. And we know that gray matter uh, is much more disabling than white, white, white matter. In fact, gray matter lesions occur first, and then white matter lesions occur later. So um, by the time you see white matter lesions, the person may have had MS a long time, but didn't realize that they had it. So gray matter lesions are, can cause severe fatigue. They can cause um, cognitive dysfunction and uh, significant disability over time. So are you saying that uh, physical disability would be more a white matter lesion than a gray matter lesion? No, not necessarily. So uh, think of a person who has um, primary progressive MS. Um, they have sometimes they'll have a lot of dis they'll have a lot of disability, but we can't find as many lesions on the brain. They, they tend to be uh, spinal cord lesions. Um, but we now think that people with primary progressive MS may have more gray matter damage than they do white matter. But so in the gray matter, those are cells. Those are bodies. Um, they're not myelinated. They have very few myelinated. Um, uh, bodies in the gray matter. Those are primarily, uh, myelin is primarily in the white matter. So we call it the white matter because the myelin makes it look white. So, um, but gray matter uh, um, disease 
is can cause uh, disability much faster. But you can get disability with white matter disease. But white matter disease is, uh, affects the axon. So um, it depends on where in the brain lesions occur uh, as to what type of symptoms you have. Now, there's areas of the brain that are more, we call it prime real estate, because there are areas of the brain that are more, you, it's a smaller area called the midbrain, uh, where the pons and the medulla, the cerebellum are, and a lesion in that area can cause significant disability, like ataxia, tremors, um, difficulty walking, it can cause problems with speech, and so forth. But the, in the cortex of the brain, the large part of the brain, um, you can have many lesions and have no symptoms. I've had patients with 50 or 60 lesions around the ventricles and not have any symptoms at all. Eventually, they will eventually, may show some signs of cognitive decline, but um, it just depends on where your lesions occur. Are you familiar with, um, I think it's Stephen Krieger's theory of the swimming pool? I've seen his theory. I can't explain, explain okay, but I well, do understand it. If, yes. if you've got all these lesions coming up from the bottom of right. the pool, right. and the residual reserve of the right. pool is declining, right. then you see spikes of lesions. Correct. Correct. So are we assuming that all those lesions are always there, and it's only a matter of the residual Declining. So, let's talk about reserve, the the neurologic Thank reserve. You. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you're basically talking. His graphic is very is very good the way he explains it. But on uh, neurologic reserve, those areas of the brain that are healthy, their brain, their areas of the brain where you don't have MS lesions, and very often those areas of reserve can take over uh, some of the. Um, uh, things that you that your other uh, uh, that, that the white matter has damaged for instance if you're in the speech center of the brain and you have lesions there the healthy tissue can take over can reroute itself so that you may not have as severe symptoms from those areas of demyelination those areas are very important to uh, keep healthy. So we were talking before about immunosenescence and the immune, uh, immune system of the body. Um, so the more diseases you have, the less likely you're going to have that reserve. So um, it's just really important that you manage those other disease processes. Keep your cholesterol in check. Keep your blood pressure under control. Um, and those sort of things keep those health and diabetes. Diabetes is a is a, a terrible disease that can cause MS to get worse. But um, because we now know that MS uh, patients are more prone to cardiovascular diseases, so you have to make every effort to stay healthy to to allow your immune system to work better, so the immune system can help those areas of reserve. Okay. Does anybody have any questions relating to this? How soon from when you start treatments should you have an MRI? Very good question. So we do MRIs probably uh, more frequently than uh, than other doctors or, or neuro, uh, neurology offices may do. We tend to do an MRI every year. However, at the time of diagnosis, if you have um, relatively aggressive disease or you have an increased burden of disease or you have a lot of enhancing lesions, we're going to want to see what's going on at six months. So very often we'll do one at six months. However, uh, years ago they used to say, don't change the treatment for at least a year. But that's an individualized decision. And if you're on a treatment that's not one of the, um, one of the, um, stronger treatments, then we may feel after watching you for six to 12 months that we need to change you to one of the uh, more current uh, treatments. Okay. All right, there are a couple of questions that came in from our audience, our virtual audience that take us back to the beginning questions. And I just want to um, ask this as well because I don't want them to be upset that we're not asking, but right now somebody is asking what is ataxia? Okay, ataxia is when um, you have 
a significant imbalance. So you can have ataxia in the upper extremities where it's difficult for you to go from point A to point B in a straight line. So if you have ataxia, we call it dysmetria in the upper extremities, it's difficult to be reading the paper, reach out for your coffee cup, and bring it to your face. Very hard to do for many people with, uh, many times we see tremors, but that's the same thing as ataxia in the upper extremities. In the lower extremities, tremors, well, tremors can be in the trunk as well. You can have truncal ataxia, and we can see that in the clinic because the patient can't sit up straight on the table, so they tend to wobble around a little bit. Um, but in ataxia in the legs, um, it makes it difficult for the patient to walk without assistive devices because they get imbalanced and they start tremoring and walking. Um, a little awkwardly and they're at risk for falls. So it's a it's a difficulty of going from one point to the other in a straight line, whether it's taking one step in front of the other or whether or not it's the upper extremities movement. Okay, another question just because um, again it's it, you know we're running a little bit behind on certain things. Was cognition discussed? A little bit. You yeah, know why I asked that question? Because I have cognitive problems. So I had to ask that, all right? So um, like that. So, so somebody's asking, could you repeat the cognitive dysfunctions, heard short-term memory issues, mm -hmm. and what else? Um, short-term memory, um, word finding difficulties, taking longer to process information, um, attention. So if you work in an office or you're at the mall and you're trying to focus on your list of things to do and there's a lot of noise around you, it makes it more difficult for you to process the information and to uh, complete your tasks. Great, thank okay. you for that. Sure. Going back Excuse to your diet. one second. I would add organization to that. Organization, that's true, it's very good. If you sit down at your desk and you've got 20 things, right. you gotta put it all in place and figure or, out how you're gonna work yeah, through it. Yeah, or planning your day, your day. Some patients can't pack a suitcase, they can't organize it, no, that's, it's true. And the, the same thing happens when they get on I-4 and cars are going on both sides of them, it's just, it disrupts their ability to, to keep on task. Well, if they wanna learn how to compartmentalize, I've been doing that since I was a little kid, mm -hmm. and I could work with them on that. Mm -hmm. I just can't remember how I got to that point, though. All right, so next thing, going back to when you were speaking about diets, person wanted to know um, what foods they might have to avoid. Oh, that's a very good question. So you, you want to avoid fatty foods. Um, you want to avoid, and I'm not saying you can never eat sugar, but sugar is, is I love sugar, but sugar is inflammatory. So if you eat a lot of sugar, that can cause an inflammatory process in the body. Um, also, salt. Salt is considered inflammatory as well, and so you should avoid salt or don't add more salt at the table and don't cook with a lot of salt. Those are things you should avoid. Um, I'm trying to think of others. Let's see. Um, I think, let me just say what you should eat that might be easier. So uh, plant-based diets are better, um, like the Mediterranean diet. It doesn't mean you can't ever eat meat. I, I heard Dr. Sango say one time, well, you can have uh, uh, meat, steak, red meat once a month. And that's hard for a lot of people to do because they love red meat. But red meat, you shouldn't eat all the time. It's better to eat fish because the omega-3 can help you. Omega-3 can relieve that cog fog that you get sometimes. Um, the omega-3 foods um, and a lot of the foods in the Mediterranean diet can help that, but, okay? Okay, what about, if nobody had any questions from that, but what about, um, is sugar, salt and gluten worsening their MS, or our sugar, salt and gluten? So I don't really, I, I think gluten, if you're gluten intolerant, it's gonna make everything bad, but certainly salt and sugar can, is an infl or inf can cause inflammation, and they can make you feel pretty bad. I, if I eat a lot, of, if I have a sugar load at night, the next morning I feel terrible, but I enjoyed it while I was doing it. But you have to, so you have to limit those, those, um, those foods. <laughs> All right, next one. Again, we're just trying to catch up on some of the questions. And a person asked about side effects from MS medications. Okay. 
they want to know what side effects there are from the MS medications. Well, we have 20 medications right. now. We're probably going to have 21 in September. And so all of the drugs have their own set of side effects. Some have minimal side effects, like infusion reaction or um, uh, like Ocrevus. Uh, Ocrevus, number one, is a upper respiratory infection, lower respiratory infection, or infusion reaction, whereas in the interferons, we see in, uh, liver stress, stress in liver, um, and so some of the uh, interferons even have a black box rating in other countries because uh, they can cause liver distress. Um, all of them have side effects. Now, the saponomas, the SP1 receptor agonists, those drugs um, have a uh, cart can cause a cardiovascular type event that's why you have to have an EKG before you start uh, those as a routine medication um, so if you have a cardiovascular history those are not the drugs you should use um, Tysabri can cause depression it can cause um, some um, uh, other side effects but uh, like PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which has a mouthful. But PML is uh, a, a really a deadly disease that is caused by the John Cunningham virus. There are other medications that ha have shown PML, such as um, Gelinia, Tecfidera, uh, Tysabri, and there may be one other. So any drugs in those classifications, um, you have to be careful about PML. So if you are on one of those drugs, you should ask your physician um, to test your JC antibody titer. If you're positive and you're titer, which is your index, which tells us your risk of getting PML, if your titer is over 0.4, it's considered high. I see patients with titers of three, over three, over four, over two, which are very high, and therefore they would not, and they, I would not prescribe for them a, a drug that has shown to be, to have PML, or to, to cause PML. Okay, next question. Can MS generate cancer like, um, like a breast cancer? Um, MS as itself, um, cannot cause cancer but if you are a person who has a lot of other diseases and your immune system cannot protect your body from cancer uh, and you have immunosenescence then uh, you have a prone uh, to cancers you have the markers for cancer for breast cancer you can get breast cancer but it, MS itself doesn't cause it some of the treatments that we give for MS can lead to breast cancer Okay, let's continue with the dialogue that you've got going, and we'll go back to everybody's questions in a few minutes. Okay, I want to switch and talk a little bit about stem cell therapy. Oh, sure. And HSCT therapy. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, yeah, so I, there's another letter to the very beginning, A-H-C-T, right? Am I leaving it out? So it's autogalous, meaning your body, hemopoietic, blood, hema is blood, um, stem cell transplantation. So those types of stem cells are taken from the body, usually the bone marrow, and they, they take your own stem cells out of your body and they clean them up. In the meantime, you are immunosuppressed almost to death. In fact, years ago when they used to uh, do stem, stem, this type of stem cell transplantation, there's a 20% death rate. But now the process is much better and uh, there, it's no longer as uh, scary or as dangerous. But they, they immunosuppress you so that they wipe out your immune system and during that two week period you're very protected. You're in a hospital setting and then they give you your uh, stem cells back through an IV, so they infuse it. Um, and so what the goal for, uh, for hematopoic stem cell transplantation is that it will start a new immune system, those cells will grow, and when they start growing and they build up your immune system, MS will not be part of that. And they've had great results. In fact, Mark Freeman is a neurologist in Cal uh, Ottawa, Canada. He has a huge research center and they're doing a lot of work on stem cells. Um, he um, 
has always he always talks about going inside or outside the country and i think dr steingo has talked about that you have to be very careful if you want to go to south america or somewhere in europe and have that um a stem cell transplantation because there's no guarantee they cost a lot of money and they're happy to take your fifty thousand dollars um but there's no guarantee that it's going to work so it is not fda approved yet and your insurance will not pay for it but um it's something to consider if you have uh, a lot of disability because some people actually recover and they get better after so are you saying that if I revamp my immune system with a stem cell treatment. I no longer have MS. Are my right. symptoms going to get better? It can. They may repair. To what extent? Well, it varies. I've had two patients have that study, and they had it at University of um, Minnesota, no, Northwestern University in Chicago. One uh, patient improved significantly. He had a very ataxic gait. All his movements were tremorous, and he improved significantly. And then I had an older woman, around 40, uh, and she had it, but she didn't get as good of a response. That's not old. No, that's not old. <laughs> I'm old, but that's not old. But he was younger. He was 25. <laughs> so yeah. I'm sorry I didn't say that. OK. Um, do you do you foresee this as something that's going to be happening oh, any time in the in the near future? I think it's um, proving to be a um, possibility, a great way for people to revamp their immune system, recharge or uh, regrow an immune system. I know that the physicians who are, are actually doing that those studies really believe in it i think you should go on youtube check out mark Freem friedman f-r-e-e-d-m-a-n uh neurologist in ottawa and he he's always on youtube talking about stem cells so he can talk about any type of stem cell they can make stem cells out of skin cells now so is it safer to to replace your own to clean and replace your own rather than taking um, a stem cell donors stem so cells are you talking about um embryonic stem cells mm. that Embryo and or yeah um, so donors yeah they're not um studying embryonic stem cells as much as they used to but remember there's that ethical component taking it from uh the umbilical cord the other thing that i've heard in recent years is that if you take um embryonic stem cells that whatever genetics is in that person you may adopt so if that person had the genetic code for other diseases, you you may adopt those as well. So um, it's considered to be safer to take your own stem cells. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more? I know we discussed it some about lifestyle choices oh, sure. and how medications might affect a person's life. Um, which kind of medications? MS medications. Any of them? Okay. <laughs> Not happy pills. Yeah, so um, treatment, let's go about treatments, and we have options for everybody now, um, can delay progression and in some cases improve. So we have several medications now that not only prevent progression, but they, um, they've shown improvement after you've been on them for a period of time. Lifestyle choices are very important. They're, and I talk about them with my patients all the time. So um, a healthy lifestyle can improve symptoms. Um, it can um, manage, help you manage relapses when they occur. Um, let me talk to you about um, some of the lifestyle choices. So I heard a, a proverb one time, an old Chinese proverb, that said wellness is like a house of many rooms, and you have to spend time in each room to be truly healthy, to be truly well. So if you uh, spend a lot of time in your physical room where you working on your health and your MS, but you don't spend any time on your in your emotional room where you're trying to work on depression or a stress management and so forth, then you're gonna be off balance. So it's important that you look at all aspects of wellness. Um, some of the healthy things that you can do are to eat well. We've talked about a diet. Um, others are exercise, we've talked about that. Um, sleep. 
I find that many MS patients don't sleep. I mean, that's just a natural symptom, I think, that occurs. But a lack of sleep, you should sleep at least seven hours a night. And a lack of sleep uh, can cause imbalance of your gait. It can cause a worsening of your cognition. You can have difficulty con uh, concentrating. Uh, word finding becomes an issue. So sleep is very important, and your body rejuvenates itself during sleep. So you have to get REM sleep for seven hours. If you're not sleeping, then you need to see a sleep doctor. Some practices have sleep doctors. We have a, a neurologist in our office that addresses sleep, and he evaluates uh, all of our patients that, that aren't sleeping well. How about too much sleep? Too much sleep can be um, a sign of depression, and so... Um, uh, you have to investigate why that's happening, and he can do that very well. So, <laughs> okay, um, let's talk a little bit about managing okay. your MS. What you can do to help manage your MS, and maybe some special tricks that help people. Okay, so I um, see. I talk about so many things about our patients. So when patients come into the MS center, and they're new to me after I've gone over their entire history and get to know them a little bit. I do talk about um, the treatments, being on treatment. You know, there's a whole bunch of people that don't take treatment. Only about 60% take treatment. And then only, and about half of those are adherent to treatment. So uh, there's quite a few people that don't do well because their adherence is poor. But treatment, you have to be um, uh, adherent to your treatment, regimental to that. You ha you need to keep up with your medications. Um, make sure that you take your med other medications like they're prescribed. You have to um, um, eat food. You know, a lot of people, especially our teenagers, don't eat. And so they can't really keep themselves healthy. So you have to eat a healthy diet. Um, try to exercise. We've talked about that a lot. Um, and keep a list of things that you that are you're having problems of. Now, my patients email me or text me, but um, uh, and that's why I like a comprehensive center is because we take care of the whole person in that way. But um, so keep a list of questions you need to talk to the doctor about the most important first, not last. And um, let's see, what else do I have them do? Okay. So, um, but write down everything that, that you feel is going wrong. And if you have symptoms of relapse or progression, you should call the office right away. How about um, any kind of tricks to help with memory? Oh, anything sure. Anything people can do yes. to help so, remember? Yes, and I use those tricks too because I'm almost 71. But um, so the tricks for um, your memory, uh, there's lots of uh, things that you do. Stuart plays Scrabble online. There, uh, I played the word games in um, sort of a scrabble but it's you can do it by yourself so there's all kinds of online games that help you uh, beef up your memory and your your you know your brain is like a muscle and so you have to use it and exercise it um, to uh, prevent um, some of those cognitive dis uh, symptoms but um, so the, the games are good a reading is good one of the rooms that you have to spend time in is called intellectual and so you ought to always be searching to do things that are new learning things that are new reading is one of the best things to increase brain volume and um, so I encourage reading if you can't read then you can um, have uh, audio books and so there's lots of things just always learning something new and how about if you're on the spot and you're trying to remember something? Any ideas for that? Or do you guys have any ideas for that? Well, well, you have to make an, like, I have a patient who told me the other day that he has memory problems with regards to names. So he always puts a picture in his head of that person and association to their name. So he said, I may pause and think about it for a second, but usually I can, it comes to me within a few, about five seconds. So this, but make an association. Use your phone, that's Use your right. phone, that's great. <laughs> that's Another good. thing I do is if I'm going from the bedroom to the kitchen mm -hmm. to get something, I, I repeat in my head over, over and over and over, and over the yeah. three things and then I'll remember 
three. Right. So hopefully when I get there, I remember what the... I know there were three, and then I can usually come up with right. two, and I'm looking around for the third. So I like what um, this individual said, to use your phone when you meet a new person, write their phone, their names down, and uh, so trigger yourself to remember them. That's a good idea. Also, Repetition is good. Alarms on your phone to help sure. you remember to do things. <laughs> Um, those are good hints. I like to write things down and take a photo of it and then I remember it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's a That's reminder right. for yourself. That's, That's great. Right. That's right. Very it good. Stick, it sticks better as a picture than it does in writing. That's because you're using all the modes of learning, visual, um, physical, um, and I think there's another one. But those are modes of learning. So if you do all of them, it's more likely that you're going to remember it. Sure. Mm -hmm. Let's move on a little bit to um, talking about your health care team. Sure. And we're going to deal with um, comprehensive health care centers. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about what that is, please? Okay. A comprehensive uh, MS care center is one that has all the options available to patients. They treat the whole person. So um, some of them have everything under one roof. They'll have physical, occupational, speech therapy. They'll have pharmacy. They'll have uh, some of your specialists, like uh, neuropsychologists, psychologists. Um, and then there are other centers, like our center. We have sleep. We have neuropsychology. We have, and we used to have all the rehab folks, but we grew too big, and they moved to a different area, but we still have them as part of our team. So an MS care team, uh, an MS care program can be comprehensive, but it can be also virtual as well. You have to have those contacts out in the community. I think Dr. Steinko has talked about that, and he says so that you have people that you work with, urology, psychiatry, but they're out in the community. It's a virtual conference, it's there. The neurologist. He's the number one leader of the team. He makes all the decisions that, that buck stops with him. He's head of all the research, so general neurologist. And if, um, if your care is not all under one roof, uh -huh. is it the patient's responsibility or the doctor's responsibility to get everybody involved talking to each other? No, it, and that's a team effort, so that if I see a patient and I want to refer them back to their gynecologist. Say a, a woman comes in and she's pregnant. There's a lot to do when they come in and they're pregnant and they're on treatment or whatever. But I, write, I either call the obstetrician's office or I write a letter to the obstetrician. We start a plan, a care plan. What are we going to do if she relapses? What is safe to do for the baby? What are we going to do after the baby's born? Are we going to give her ster steroids right away to prevent relapse? Or are we going to start treatment right away? Uh, or is she going to breastfeed, which does provide some protection? So there's a care plan. Same thing goes with the urologist who's taking care of the bladder, or the neuropsychologist who's helping us with cognitive issues. So. But whose responsibility is it to open that communication? The clinician. So, uh, of course, the buck stops with the neurologist, but I'm an extender of him. So I am a nurse practitioner. So it would be if I refer a patient, it's my responsibility to make that dialogue happen. And if they don't follow up with you? The patient or the nurse or the, the, the specialist. Other specialist. Well, we we I, I would call them, but if that if that's a problem over time, we would have to find somebody else because we want the best care for our patients. And I think um, a lot of community physicians are excellent and they provide excellent care. But if they order PT or they order a consult with uh, a specialist, it's up to the patient to find that specialist. We do that for them. So, Okay. Let's switch gears again and, and get to the topic of the moment, which is COVID-19. Okay. And can you tell us about how that affects people with multiple sclerosis? Okay, so COVID-19 um, does not affect people with MS any, in, any differently than it does the general population because MS is a disease of an overactive immune system. A lot of people think that it's a disease that immunosuppresses you, and therefore they're at greater risk, that it's not true. So many people with MS have, 
are very healthy, especially when they're diagnosed, they have, have no disease, they've never had a cold, a virus, or anything, because they have an overactive immune system. So overactive that those B cells and T cells get confused, and then uh, they end up getting um, uh, MS. So, but we do want them to take the precautions that we ask of everybody else. Distance, social distancing, uh, now, I have some of my patients still wear gloves. You go to the grocery store, you wear gloves because you can't wipe down everything in the store. Plastic, you know, just plastic gloves. Uh, and a face mask is mandatory. If they don't do anything else, I have them wear a face mask. Um, if they have a lot of other comorbidities, uh, let's say they're 55 years old and they have diabetes, they have cardiovascular disease. I don't want them going to the grocery store. And the CDC and the MS Society, which uh, carries those suggestions as well, they need to stay home. And now that COVID has just increased dramatically in our area, uh, I would prefer they stay home, have their groceries delivered. They have grandchildren, have them do the shopping or their children. Uh, and they, they should stay home and away from people, other people that don't live with them. If a patient with MS does become ill with COVID and they don't have any other comorbidities, how does the MS influence the course of their disease with well, COVID? Well, any, any stress to the body is going to affect the MS, okay? So with COVID, most people will have a fever. And so uh, a person with MS who has a lot of symptoms or have had a lot of symptoms in the past, those symptoms may resurface, just like if you had the flu or a virus. And so, um, of course, with COVID, uh, the, the illness is much more severe because there's usually lung involvement and so forth. So um, it's going to make you feel much worse. It may eventually lead to a relapse, actually. So, um, but it's not going to necessarily change the course of their MS. So a person with MS who gets an upper respiratory infection, they feel pretty bad. But with COVID, it's going to be a much more serious and significant illness. Right now in this country, we're dealing with several major things going on. Um, the economy, the COVID-19, the racial problems. What can people do or what would you suggest for, for the mental health of these people that are trying to deal with all this and having multiple sclerosis right. at the same time. Right. So there um, are uh, individuals that can do online therapy. There are social workers. There are psychologists. There are uh, LCSWs, which are licensed social workers, who will talk to you on the phone, who have programs uh, even on YouTube, and they will talk to you specifically about your uh, depression, your anxiety. There's a lot of work in that. Um, there are even some tapes you can get and listen to to help you with, to relax and to help with your anxiety. Um, there are uh, even some programs that can help you mindfulness. Y'all know what mindfulness is where you sit quietly all by yourself and you think about yourself. You think about how other people see you and you don't, you're not hard on yourself, you don't uh, judge yourself, but you just think, you, you're mindful. How you treat other people, how do they treat you? And that does a lot for the brain, it does a lot for anxiety, can improve anxiety, can even uh, improve depression. Now, for depression though, um, those patients need to be treated. I'm a big believer in antidepressants and counseling as well, but the counseling can uh, be over the phone. Well, just like we're doing telemedicine now, um, those individuals, they can seek counseling um, over, the, uh, over the phone. The other thing is if financial burden becomes an issue, there are some programs out there for MS patients and for others to get financial assistance. So you can go to the National MS Society website. Um, the MS News and Views may have that as well and the MS Foundation, and they will <laughs> give you the contact information. So. Stuart, do we have any more questions? I think we're just about finished with our discussion up here. We have lots of, we have lots of questions from the audience, and our board is filled, 
filled with questions. I mean, it's raining so hard outside, I know we're not going anywhere. Nope. So <laughs> we can start with the audience, okay. and then we will go back to the questions. Okay. okay, so can you read me your question, please? So this patient would like to know, if they start with relapse remitting multiple sclerosis, how do they know when they increase, if they do increase, to another form of the disease, like secondary or primary? Okay. Okay, and there are some signs. So um, if you have progression of your disease, worsening of your symptoms, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can talk really loud. Okay. Um, if you have uh, worsening of your symptoms, um, progression of your disease, where you feel like you're having a relapse, but there's no indication on your MRI that there's disease progression, that's one sign of secondary progressive. Also, if you have steady progression over one year and there's no new lesions, no, re no true relapses, that's a sign of secondary progression transition. Most people who are going to have secondary progressive MS can transition anywhere from 15 uh, to 20 years after, di after diagnosis. Um, and then sometimes we'll give steroids to people that just absolutely feel like they're having a relapse, even though there's no indication on the MRIs. We may give them steroids to uh, help, the, help, help them feel better, and they get no uh, response from the steroids. That's another indication of secondary progressive. But generally, it doesn't happen before 10 to 20 years, sometimes seven, sometimes a little bit longer. So. Okay. If anybody here uh, has their windows open, you're in trouble. You're in deep trouble. You might as well get out the paddles right now because it is pouring. Okay? All right, great. Let's continue. Next person have a question. So she's asking um, if there's a problem with using white sugar. Is there a problem with white sugar? Right. If you eat too much of it, yes. Uh, sugar is inflammatory. So... Um, if you eat a lot of sugar products, like my teenage son, who's my teenage grandson, who's 17, he's sugar all the time. He's a toothpick. I resent that, but um, you can it, it can cause some inflammation. And you have to remember the gut. The, if you've heard a lot about the microbes in your gut, the gut, the stomach, it's very important. And so. Um, if there's a disruption of those microbes, they, it, it can make you sick. And some, uh, there's been some uh, indication that MS can be caused by the irregular microbes in the gut. What about the artificial sweeteners? Same thing? Well, the artificial sweeteners have their own set of uh, problems. So there's been some research that says... Um, some, I won't name them, but some of the artificial sweeteners can cause cancer and lead to cancer. Um, so I don't generally uh, use those. Now, stevia, you, y are y'all familiar with stevia? So that's an artificial sweetener that a lot of people that are vegan, they will cook with stevia. Um, that uh, is okay. That's the one that's okay. It's not un unhealthy. Let me run around the room real quick. Who's next? She was saying that she uses agave or Aga any other yeah, natural. Yeah, agave is in a, I think agave is in the same class. I can't, don't quote me. I'd have to go back and research it. But some people use agave, some people use stevia. And I think they may be similar. But agave is plant-based, isn't it? It comes from a plant, so it's probably okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody, next question? You're all good? I got a lot on the board there. All right. So... I know that the speakers were jumping around a little bit, so I'll try to keep it in, 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 in some kind of order here. But um, let's see, we have, um, how often should, do I have to have MRIs each year is the question. Um, not, we, all, we used to do MRIs every year. Years ago, we did them every two years. But now that radiologists have found gadolinium deposits in the brain, which is not causing, it doesn't cause you any harm, but we try to be more mindful of that. And so we tend to do them every 18 months to two years. Unless you have symptoms of progression or symptoms of relapse, then we're going to do an MRI. Okay. Okay. 
What kind of testing is available to test cognitive function disability? Okay, so we do cognitive screening in the office. I'll do a symbol digit modalities test. Some of you are familiar with that. You can look that up. That is a test that was developed by neuropsychologists for MS patients. Then some of us do the MS composite, where you do the nine-hole peg test, the 25-foot walk, and then you do the um, PACE serial uh, uh, audio additions test. It's a very difficult test. So we use other tools. We might use the, um, the um, a cognitive assessment. Many, pe many people will use a symbol digit, and then they'll do a word testing, a memory test, give you a list of words and see how if you can remember them and there are other tests out there to use but those are used for screening in the MS centers um, real uh, cognitive testing neuropsych testing is done by the neuropsychologist much okay. more extensive all right huh? next one is 3t MRI more useful in identifying progression when you normally use just the normal uh, single version so there are MRIs that use a magnet, it's called the magnet, um, a 1.5 magnet or a 2.0 magnet, the three te and that's the Tesla, the magnet is the Tesla. So a three Tesla MRI shows you more information. So you may have your original MRI with a one and a half Tesla, and then your doctor wants more information. So next time he wants you to go to a center that has a three Tesla MRI, and that will show more information. Sometimes it shows more lesions that we couldn't see on the lesser magnet, and sometimes patients are afraid they have new disease. Uh, that is not the case. It's just that we can see more information. So the brain, uh, the brain matter is more defined, and um, so now there's a lot of research in the seven Tesla MRI, which you can actually see the axons. I don't know if that will ever come to uh, community use because it's, uh, it, it pulls the neck so we don't do the cord with the seven Tesla MRI, unless they've changed it or, or perfected it. So, But it's interesting to see Dr. Ramahan in Miami did a lot of research on the seven Tesla MRI, and you can actually see the axons. It's really fabulous for a clinician to see. Great. I'm trying to take off my glasses so I can hear you better. Oh. <laughs> Your mask is by fogging That's them up, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Next one, can you tell me, as a MS patient, what causes my senses to be heightened? For example, sound and smell. So maybe I should have cut my nose and I could hear better. <laughs> so is the question is that if you lose a sense, the others are heightened? Is that what your question? No, the question that this person is asking is, can you tell me, as an MS patient, what causes my senses to be heightened? Okay. Like, for example, her or his sound and smell okay so you can have lesions in certain areas of the brain that will make your senses more hypersensitive it can be touch it can be smell it can be taste uh, and that uh, is usually uh, from lesions in the central nervous system the cranial nerves would be taste seeing hearing but um, they can be heightened or diminished. All right, next question. I really don't know what the person is referring to, but they want to know what kind of oils they can use. Okay. Could be CBD, I don't know could what they're- Could be, could be CBD. CBD oils, topical oils can help with uh, sensation. You know, those can be really um, absorbed very well, so you have to be very careful what kind of oils you're talking about. So if they're steroidal, then they're going to really affect your, um, they're going to be quickly absorbed, and then it can affect your adrenal glands. So you have to be careful what you're talking about. But uh, CBD oils can be very effective for sensory phenomena. They can be effective for um, stiffness in the extremities, pain in the extremities, um, tight muscles, and that sort of thing, topical oils. Um, I can't answer that further without specifics. Okay. I, okay. All right, next. Um, what, uh, let's see, hormonal imbalance, premenopause, do they worsen MS? 
That's very interesting because I just had a patient the other day who um, is having more problems during her menses. She's a little early for menopause. She's in her 40s. But during her menses, she has terrible, terrible headaches, which are hormonal. But she has other MS symptoms that seem to heighten. And so uh, that does occur because during your menses, your core body temperature goes up. During menopause, your core body temperature goes up. So some of those symptoms are going to be more apparent. And the person who has uh, MS uh, increased symptoms during her menstrual cycle, we may use some prednisone. Uh, 10 milligrams, 5 or 10 milligrams a day during that week. Um, every month usually will help uh, the symptoms. Some people use other medications like gabapentin and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, and in menopause, um, you know, the, what can really help that is a hormone replacement therapy, but that's got a big no-no now because of the uh, cancer risk. But um, we send our patients to um, their gynecologist who can ha help with that. Okay, I try sorry. not to do gynecology. So. so with this rain piling on this roof, and I know the audience cannot hear it, but in here we're having difficulty hearing. So, All right, next question is, how dangerous is sugar in fruits when you're juicing? Okay, so those are natural sugars, and so um, the, the inference to sugars is not quite the same. So fruits and, and vegetables give a lot, I mean, yeah, and vegetables, some have sugar in them, uh, give a lot of positive things to the body, but you can overdo it with fruits. They're very high in calorie and in sugar content, so you have to use them in moderation. You can have it every day, but you have to use it in moderation. A person wants to know if nap time would help an MS patient. Nap time can help an MS patient if they are suffering from MS-related fatigue. Um, so uh, some patients uh, will take a nap at, they'll get up at 7 in the morning and by 11 o'clock they're exhausted. And so they may take a nap. Some people just need a 20 minute uh, rester, I call it. And then it can give them more energy. So yes. Okay. Uh, back to hormonal imbalance. Were you in the middle of that before? No. Oh, we were talking about menopause. Yeah, I covered that. Okay. All right, so, all right, let's uh, go beyond that. Um, so, I, part of my screen is still knocked out, which is the problem here. So, let's go on to something, let's go on to something really different, all right? Let's go back to a question that I've been waiting to ask you because so many people have this question. I mean, I, I, I've heard, I've asked many doctors to, to discuss this, but, um, would you please explain to the MS patients about being immune compromised or not? Okay. Um, MS patients, by virtue of just having MS, are not immunocompromised. They have an overactive immune system, um, not an immunosuppressed system. So um, they can become immunosuppressed. Um, by the medication that we use to treat MS. And that's why we do labs to look at their blood count and, um, and so forth. Thank you. Are there any RA meds that are contraindicated with, which, with MS medications? Yes. Um, so if you're going to take teraflutamide, you wouldn't want to take a like drug, which is often used in RA. There are some RA drugs uh, that patients take which are immunosuppressant, and so therefore they don't have to take an MS drug because the outcome is the same, you see? So if they're taking a drug that is immuno a, an immunosuppressant, then we may or may not put them on an MS drug because if they are staying immunosuppressed, we don't want to further cause them any problem. Does that make sense? Sure. Thank like you. rituxan. If they're on rituxan for their RA, we don't need to give them ocrelizumab for their MS. So rituxan uh, is used for both diseases, and some of the medications they use. Um, are not for MS, but they reach the same outcome. All right, one person just wrote that they want to know what RA is that you're answering. A rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, 
I want to thank our audience, our virtual audience, because during that blackout that we had, we only lost four people. So touche. Yay. Thank you all for being there. All right. Excellent. Thanks for sticking around. All right. Next question. Is there any cure in reach or being discussed an actual cure for multiple sclerosis? I think the goal now is to uh, help people live well and live better. Um, there's always the goal of finding the cause of MS, and there's researchers that are always looking for the cause. The problem is that the cause of MS may be different in everybody. So they may have different um, genetic makeups. They may have a different allele. They've learned, though, that there's over 200 alleles, which are genetic pieces, that can lead to MS, might be the genetic cause that leads to MS. And so it'd be kind of hard to um, find the cause of MS with so many different uh, genetic makeups. Um, so um, I guess that would be my answer, that it's, it may not be likely in, our, in my lifetime, let me just say. Okay, and does thank you for those answers, by the way. And next one, um, the does having multiple sclerosis mean a shortening of my life? No, um, MS only um, shortens life no more than five years, and that's only in patients who have a significant disability. Um, for instance, a person who. Um, may be very disabled and is in a wheelchair uh, a lot of the time, they may lose the ability to breathe deeply. And so, and that's another thing we look at, we listen to their lungs. So if they can't breathe deeply and they get a virus like COVID or they get pneumonia um, or um, bronchitis, um, that can, or urinary tract infection that can, and the, and the organism can get in the blood. It's hard for them to, uh, to fight infection. We, um, that may shorten their life. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Can I jump in a second? Sure. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, if a vaccine for the COVID virus mm -hmm. becomes available, live or dead, and which one could a person with MS take? You know, that's a very good question and a very important question. The best answer would be a dead virus, but we don't know if there's going to be a vaccine with a dead virus. And most people are going to want to take that, that vaccine. So they will take a life. Well, I'm not saying that I would want my patient to take a life one. I'm saying most people are going to want to take the vaccine because the outcome could be deadly. But would you recommend they take a live vaccine? I have to wait and see. And it would be in, and it would be individual for each patient, I think. Age, health, and all of that has to be considered. Person wants to know um, they're they only because they heard you talking about RA. They want to know that if they have arthritis in their lower back, uh, if, if there's anything that you want to say about any medications that might be available for that. Um, low back pain and can and arthritis. It can be osteoarthritis, which is most likely, but people do have RA. They're very different. Um, osteoarthritis can occur and patient has a lot of pain in the back. Sometimes they have pain in the back because of MS in that the gait is altered. And over years of walking with a disrupted gait, it can alter the spine, the discs in the spine. Um, so we tend to help them with that with medications such as uh, gabapentin, anything that can block those pain pathways. We tend not to use narcotics, but we um, do like to help them with that pain. If there's any correction that can be done, we tend to send them to neurosurgeons um, to look at whether the discs need to be um, partly removed or uh, addressed. If the discs are moving close to the spinal cord, a lot of times those discs move and they come closer to touching the cord. That's very important. So that has to be addressed. Um, and sometimes surgical intervention uh, can occur. And we tend to send them to neurosurgeons for that. Okay. You have a question. One minute. I got to get over there. Mask back on. Hold on. 
nothing that you have talked, buddy, have to do with is what your opinion about um, natural medicine, acupuncture, you know, how they call it, a comprehensive uh, medicine, which I... Yes, complementary medicine, because I believe in it. It works for me. Acupuncture is the best thing I ever found for for my symptoms. So, okay. what is so your we, we all use complementary medicines every day, and one of the biggest complementary medicines that we use in MS is vitamin D. Um, vitamin D acts like a, a immunomodulator. It can modulate the immune system because your... Um, your immune cells are circulating in the body all the time looking for vitamin D and most people that are newly diagnosed are deficient but vitamin D can help your immune system stay healthy so that it can take care of your of your MS and other diseases so that's the big one there are um, uh, vitamin B12 which is a B, the B vitamin or the B12 vitamin helps make a healthy immune system I mean excuse me nervous system so it helps the nervous system so that's very important um, if we do not mind acupressure or acupuncture um, either one is okay as long as our patient sees a certified board certified acupuncturist and there are other things you know I don't there's a, my colleague Megan Weigel who um, is a holistic nurse practitioner in Jacksonville she speaks she's on YouTube all the time she speaks on other uh, uh, complimentary things that can be done for symptom management um, some uh, we I don't tend to require ask patients to take them because they've not been studied in clinical trials we really don't know what it can how it can affect the individual versus uh, the masses so uh, but uh, there you know I do omega-3 omega-3 is very important um, and you can get it from eating fish or you can get it from taking a supplement as well um, so there are supplements that we use um, our complementary medicines that we use for patients exercise is considered a complementary you know I talk about that a lot but it is considered a complementary um, not a medicine but a complementary treatment so do you know if there is a uh, if the novo pneumonia uh, do you know if the pneumonia vaccine will help with a cough will help with what coughing <sighs> okay let me go back up and say, when I talked about Megan, I want everybody to look her up. I didn't mean to say that she does a different medicine than I do. Uh, however, she's the brain. She is the MS brain on it, as well as um, Alan Bolin. Bol Bol what's his Bol name? Bol 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 Bolin. Bowling. Bowling. Alan Bowling, Megan Weiger. They are the Weigel. They are the brains on complementary medicine, and. Um, uh, substances other substances used like alpha lipoic acid that's another one alpha alpha lipoic acid is actually being studied now as a treatment for ms It's a ways off but it, you'll hear more about it in the coming years and your your question i'm sorry well i'm going to back up to that in a minute but okay. alan bowling's in colorado yes. and megan weigel's in jacksonville, jacksonville. and mm -hmm. megan is phenomenal and she has spoken she at many, many, yeah. many MS Fuse and News programs. Right. And she's so, a good friend of mine. Oh, that's right. She could, and she's on the internet. That's and right. And that's she's right. on Facebook all the time. Yes, she is. She was on yes. there today, wrote a very long. Yes, about um, her son. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So with, uh, you know, and, and the illness that's in the area, you know, what's going on in Jacksonville. So, but she's always on. She's always uh, promoting things on social media. And, uh, and she's a great gal to know with as far as, you know, alternative treatments. Yes. And she's a yoga master. Yes, so. she is a yoga master. And she's a good friend of mine. That's right. So. That's right. Okay. So the person was asking, um, with regard to pneumonia, if they had a pneumonia vac, if she had a pneumonia vaccine, will that help with her cough? Um, not necessarily. The pneumonia vaccine is a vaccine that helps prevent certain types of pneumonia. There are two different, or two injections, or two uh, uh, types of medication for pneumonia vaccine. But um, if the cough is due to pneumonia, is it may or may not help. But I, you, you don't take a pneumonia vaccine to help a cough. That's not the purpose. Okay. Her other question: What you? Her, her other question is, will it help with COVID-19? Um, well, let me just say this. 
everyone that should have a pneumonia vaccine should have it. And I think this is a good time uh, to get it because COVID-19 can cause pneumonia as well as cardiovascular issues. So. Okay, great. Any other questions from the audience? Anything you got going? Great. Let me mask up and get over to you again. That's an easy one for her. So she wants to know if you could take two different MS meds, and she was asking about Ampira and Ocrevus. Um, Ampira is not a treatment for MS. It is a symptom management drug for abnormal gait. And yes, you can take Ogrevus, which treats the MS, and the Ampira, which treats the abnormal walking, okay? Except that you have to make sure you don't have any um, adverse concerns, because Ampira can lead to seizures and bladder infections and so forth. So your clinician will look into that and see if you're a good candidate for it. It's kind of a combination of what, she, uh, what you ask, um, of about the vaccine that you know they always every year they ask us to get the vaccine for um no the virus is not no the flu and you mentioned that don't get the live um vaccine and then you mentioned uh, oh when we have a mess right not but it's not recommended right but I didn't say don't get it. That's up to your physician. So what is the question with regards to flu? Because of, you mentioned also about the COVID, you know, that it may be a, a medication, you know, that dead or, alive. dead or alive. So that is something that we have to watch for. But in an emergency, if you don't have anybody near you, how will you know that what you're, they're giving you? <laughs> well, you have to trust your physician, the main thing. So, or who's, yeah, that's true. So you just have to get the advice of a healthcare provider and, and trust their decision. Um, I'm not saying I advocate a live vaccine, but I'm saying if COVID gets much more severe in our country and the, a vaccine comes out that can be a benefit, that would be a huge decision to make. And it would have to be made with the patient in a huge discussion and talk about it, so. I mean, let's face it, it could be life or death. So we have to consider that. Okay, great. So I think we've reached the end of our questions. I think. Oh, you know what? There was one more. Sorry okay, about that. Okay, that's okay. The one more question is they want to know which medications would make them immune compromised. Okay. So there are some medications that can lower the white count. And uh, one is um, gelenia because gelenia sequesters the T cells and the B cells in the lymph nodes. And so you only have about 25% uh, of your immune cells circulating in the body. So that can lower, um, you're not considered immunosuppressed because those, those uh, cells, immune cells are still there, but they're, they're, you just can't access them because of the gelenia. And of course with gelenia we have saponamod, we have um, Pasanamod. I'm thinking of, there's like four drugs that, that are like Gelenia. So make sure you know what you're taking and what they do. Um, Mavenclad is a new drug. It's an oral drug. It's um, for relapsing forms of MS. It is a tablet that you take uh, uh, just a couple of times, a series of two series of Mavenclad a year. The next year you do another two series. Mavenclad is uh, made uh, from cladribine, which is an immunosuppressant, and it's been used in cancer treatment over the years. However, Mavenclad is a very small dose that's weight-based. Um, uh, very often it doesn't cause immunosuppression, but we have to look at the white count because in some people it might cause immunosuppression. Okay, let's go see what else. Um, Ocrevus has, it's, has been suggested that it may cause immunosuppression, but Ocrevus only affects three of the B cells with the CD20 marker. It doesn't affect all your B cells. And it can affect some of your T cells, but you, for the most part, have all of your T cells. 
and two of your B cells left to fight infection. And so we are not seeing much immunosuppression, although we have to be aware of that and we have to check our patients for that. Um, let me look at my list. I have a list here of all the medications. I thought Jill was going to ask me what they were, so I brought my list. So um, the, the interferons, which are plat we consider platform drugs, they were the original treatments of MS along with glutirimer. Um The interferons can lower the white count, and so can Abajo. Abajo uh, works much like an interferon, but Abajo has been known to uh, lower the white count. And with that drug, sometimes people don't come back to normal once uh, their white count is lowered. Um, I think that's it. I think it can also happen with Tecfidera, but I don't want to say that absolutely because it comes to mind that it can happen with Tecfidera. Oh yes, Lemtrada, the big one. So Lemtrada is um, a drug that can change the outlook of your MS and can change your general health because it can cause other problems later down the road, even five years down the road. But it can cause some immunosuppression and sometimes patients don't come back to normal. I've seen that. Thank you, Jill, because that I have seen. Okay, it's okay. I'm fine, I'm fine. All right, we only have time for two more questions here and from the audience. Uh, it's something that uh, I'm always asking. I am an organ donor. Because I have a mess, I'm still able to do that? I don't know if the organs... No, the brain usually is donated for studies. But uh, I have an organ... I am in my license an organ donor for any, so... Most of the time, what organ donors, they, they want your kidneys and your eyes, your corneas. Um, your eyes may be affected by MS, but probably not the cornea specifically. So you can be an organ donor. Um, if they would take your, your organs, it would depend on uh, your overall health. And, and uh, you know, I'm not saying they wouldn't take your organs because I believe they would. Okay. Yeah, they don't transplant brains. So. All right. Last group of questions from, last group of questions from the uh, virtual audience is that um, due to COVID, I've delayed an MRI, and due to COVID, I've delayed starting Ocrevus. How long can I go with this delay for either or both? Okay. So um, the MS Society and the Consortium of MS Centers came out with suggestions for our healthcare providers in starting new treatments during the COVID virus. Um, now that the COVID's not going away, it's getting worse, we have to revisit those suggestions. And one of them is to delay starting Ocrevus um, depending on the health of the patient. So um, we've had, um, some patients that we've delayed, and then we, most of the time we go, if they're healthy and their blood count is healthy, their white count is healthy, we go ahead and put them on treatment. Um, I can't answer the question specifically because I don't know the patient's situation or the state of their multiple sclerosis. If this is a patient who has highly active disease and needs to be on treatment right away, if they're healthy and their, uh, their blood count is normal, you might consider going ahead and starting the treatment at the advice of your healthcare provider. Not because I said so, please. <laughs> okay, we have come to the end of our program. Yay, I wanna thank both of our guest speakers here. We gotta thank uh, Connie Easterling and Jill is our MS patient champion here today. I want to thank our audience that came down in this climate that we're now living in. Um, this was a great program. It's very much needed by everybody. I'm glad that we were able to do this again in this way. And, um, you know, again, I want to thank our audience, okay? Uh, you know, doing these programs this way, this is a new way of the future of us doing all of our virtual programs. And we also have uh, MS views now. It's a, I'm going to take this off for a second, all right? Hi, guys. Yeah, it's my face. Um, so um, we are, um, 
We have the MS Views Now, which is a virtual program which we're doing once a month with different doctors around the country uh, on various topics. Though during the program, we do make sure to cover the latest updates on COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis. So we've been doing these webinars and these virtual programs for a period of time already. So when COVID struck the United States, it was very easy for MS Views and News to just say, let's go virtual. Let's get on, let's get our programs on GoToWebinar. And we were able to transform very quickly. And MS Views and News will continue to do these events, not only during COVID-19, not only while this exists here in the United States, but even when we finally are able to rat eradicate this or, or get rid of this entirely from our society, all right, MS Views and News will continue to do virtual programs as we go forward. By the way, I notice as I'm talking right now, I have spray coming out of my lips, all right? And that is the spray that these face coverings are here to protect the people around you. All right, so again, these face masks were not designed actually to protect you from getting anything, though if everybody around you were wearing one, you would not get it, all right? That's the bottom line, all right? And that's what we try to promote. And I know there's a lot of activist groups are out there that are saying, I am free, I'm living in a free country and I don't have to wear this. Well, you do and you should and your family should and everybody around you should and then we could get rid of this virus a lot sooner than what is currently happening. All right. And that's my message for you all. All right. We got to be serious about this. I mean, you want to grow up. You want to be able to go out. You want to be able to get out of the United States. You want to be able to do things. Well, we're not going to be able to do anything. We will not be able to do anything if everybody's stuck in their homes the rest of their lives because we're letting this thing run rampant on us. OK. And that's it. I'm done. Otherwise, I could do this all night. All right. Again, I want to thank you all out there for coming in today. And I want to thank you out there for coming in today. And I want to thank you all virtually for coming in today. And our speakers, perfect. Thank you very much. And yes, mask up, okay? And we're done for the night. Thank you.